we're going to continue on. I, I want to encourage you to get focused right now because I'm telling you, I've shared a lot of things in the past in regards to the book of Leviticus. It's my favorite book, and it's kind of a, a joke now, you know, and ha, 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 but it's not. <laughs> I would be willing to say out of the 66 books of the Bible, Leviticus would be the Lord's favorite. Now, here's the twist, everybody. Check this out. And I've been there. I just want to do what's right. I want to do some works, make sure I'm doing the right thing. That's not what it's about. It's about knowing who he is and achieving towards it. I'm telling you right now, God knows that we are, we're failures. We choose wrong. Death and life's in the power of the tongue. Why is death first? He knows our fallen nature. But what he's done is he's given us provision to overcome that, to get past all that. If you're shooting for perfection or, hey, I went 24 hours and I didn't sin, you might be a liar. (laughs) I'm just saying sometimes we get things mixed up. So more than anything, you know, the Bible talks about in all you're getting, get understanding. Get understanding. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? Why are we doing what we're doing? And ask yourself that question. You have every right to ask the leadership here, why does Beit Tehillah do this or that? Amen. Why do you guys do this? You have every right, and we'll tell you, because of this. So what's happening is, and and what's really going to help all of you, this is pretty incredible. How many churches can you go to, and you're going to learn the book of Leviticus? Can you imagine that? Pastors wouldn't even touch that with a 10-foot pole. You're brave. I said, you could be brave too because we're running out of time. We have so much to catch up on. You know, the church skipped Mount Sinai. That was the whole dilemma for 2,000 years. Now he's taking us back to the mountain and teaching us of his ways. You guys understand that? So I want to try to give you a paradigm shift, uh, a, a perspective of God, God's perspective. I want to give you God's perspective. I want you to think about God and and his thoughts are higher than our thoughts. His ways are not our ways. But how many of God reveals himself to us in who and what he is? And we can look at those attributes and say, man, he's an awesome God, you know. Our God is an awesome God. He reigns, you know. We sing and everything. So also, I, I want you to achieve today peace and direction. It's called the PAD method. It's an acronym. I want you to leave here with a real peace of God and direction. Because some of you have a face like you look a little lost. But you're going to be found. We all need an answer to prayer. We all need direction. If you don't know, you don't go. If he leads you to it, he'll get you through it. I'm so excited to represent God. I'm not going to be, I'm going to turn into an attorney right now. I'm going to present my case on the book of Leviticus and why it's God's favorite book out of 66 books in the Bible. I'm going, to, I'm going to prove to you like, like an attorney why this book is so incredible. And you all would agree it's probably the least taught in the church. I don't remember one message on Leviticus when I was in the church. Now, this isn't a, I'm not knocking it. I'm just saying it's a fact. Why would you stay so, so far away from a book that's the number one book? I used to think it was just me. And I love Leviticus. So I want to present my case as an attorney. And this is going to be a much better case than Johnny Depp. Okay? This case is going to be, I don't need a hung jury. You know, I don't want to be Johnny Depp or, you know, whatever's going on in that. Some some people are getting all into that because there's some humor, there's some sadness and whatever. But this is a beautiful case that I would like to present to you. Uh, and just just picture it, okay? Because nothing's by chance, nothing's an accident. We're going to kind of go through this, and I want to thank Sarah for typing out a survey on the book of Leviticus outline. Amen. Listen, this is beautiful. She gets typist of the year every year. She can type blindfolded. You know what I'm saying? I'm like this. So so this is a tool. This is 22 years of experience in my life. Now, how many of you know somebody's been in something for 22 years? You might want to listen to them. Amen? When I go get a haircut, I always ask the lady, and some of them are pretty funny. So how long have you been cutting hair? 
She's like, you're my first one. I'm out of here. No way. I, I, I got much to mess with, but <laughs> you're my first one. I laughed. <laughs> That's so good. Like, oh, 20 years. How many of you have been cutting hair for 20 years? You know what you're doing. Unless you move from state to state. Because you have a bad reputation. So I want to present uh, uh, the book of Leviticus like an attorney. And, and I've laid it out for you because I've studied. I've looked at, and I'm still discovering treasures. Oh, there's so many treasures in here. So just think about the first five books. Here you have Genesis. It's important. He's the creator. He creates everything. It's our family tree, right? You guys look up yourself in the family tree? Yeah, I found out I was the sap. So here's the family tree. That's great. Here we go. We're off to a great start. Oh, now we go into Exodus. Now we're in bondage. We're in Egypt. Walk like an Egyptian. Building the pyramids. Swimming in the Nile. Right? You're in it. You're, and then he brings you out. And, of course, there's the tabernacle and all that cool stuff. But then what happens? Leviticus. It's the meat of the Torah. Because numbers are all the stories where we messed up. We just didn't get it. Can't be the number one book for God. He even said, you've tested me these ten times. He was so angry. Altered my purpose. That I'm mad. People talk about COVID. He took 10 of those spies out with a plague. It wasn't Wuhan. It was Yahweh. Everybody's arguing over the plague. God's in control. He uses it. He plagues his own children because he's God. He kills. He makes alive. He establishes the terms. Thank you, Father. So then you got Deuteronomy, the book of remembrance. It's the last words of a dying man. Moses is in a nice little capsule there, is just giving them everything like a book of remembrance. So would you all agree at this point, Leviticus is looking pretty good. What if you went through the drive through at Wendy's and there's no meat in your cheeseburger? No big deal. I got Genesis, Exodus, Numbers, and Deuteronomy. I got lettuce and tomato and some mustard and mayonnaise. It's all good. No, no, no. You would go back and say, where's the beef? Where is the beef? Listen, I'm telling you right now, this message is going to change the atmosphere. It's going to change your life. You will never be the same after this one. Mark my words. Because listen, we get intimidated, then we shut down. Like I tell people to read the book of Daniel. Oh, that's confusing, Daniel and Revelation. And so I'm, I'm intimidated. Don't be. Embrace Leviticus. Want to know your father and his attributes. Amen? So, so that's my monologue. So I, I just feel led to just read. I want to read the first verse and the last verse in Leviticus and establish something that I just got when we were worshiping. I was just worshiping, and I did, the Lord just gave me this little download. In Leviticus chapter 1, verse 1, And the Lord called unto Moses and spake unto him out of the tabernacle of the congregation, saying, He's speaking out of the congregation, right? Do you see it? The tabernacle, he's speaking out of it. Well, then look. The very last verse in Leviticus 27. 27, verse 34. These are the commandments which the Lord commanded Moses for the children of Israel in Mount Sinai. Now, Moses was given a pattern to build the tabernacle. Would you all agree? Would you agree that that pattern is in heaven? Oh, yeah, you can find the furniture and everything up in heaven. So God is speaking out of the congregation, right there, the tabernacle of the congregation of Moses, just like he speaks out of heaven to John in Revelation. He's speaking from his very existence. You, it's like Star Trek, you know. He was teleported. He was beamed down so he could be with his people. But he still got the place upstairs. You see what I'm saying? See, God's doing all these things because he's a creator. He's an incredible, incredible, loving God. So we're going to jump right in here because it's so important that it's relevant for today. We live in a dirty, filthy, contaminated world, period. And the more you get cleaned up, the better you're going to be. The more you come out of that world, that social media and that culture and all that nasty stuff and those, whatever it is, you're going to feel much better about yourself. So here we go. God is wanting a kingdom of priests. 
God has wanted a kingdom of priests. Exodus chapter 19, verses 5 and 6. 1 Peter chapter 2, verses 5 and 9. He wants a kingdom of priests. Let's jump right in there in Exodus 19, 6. We're going to have the public reading of scriptures. Are you guys ready? Let's, let's hit this thing. Let's do it. And you shall be unto me a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. These are the words which thou shalt speak unto the children of Israel. So what was the responsibility of the priests? To teach the Torah. Well, where's that in the New Testament? I'm glad. I love cross-references. How many love cross-references? I do. Look at 1 Peter 2, 5. You also as lively stones are built up a spiritual house, a holy priesthood, to offer up spiritual sacrifices acceptable to God by Jesus Christ. Wow. A holy priesthood. 1 Peter 2, 9. But you are a chosen generation a royal priesthood, a holy nation, a peculiar people that you should show forth the praises of him who hath called you out of darkness into his marvelous light. Wow. He brought you out to bring you in. He showed you what sin is. Look at this. A peculiar people. He's quoting, right? Exodus 19.5. Segula, you're a precious jewel that's in his hand. He doesn't wear you like a ring. He doesn't wear you like a necklace, a toe ring, an earring, a nose ring. He actually has you in his hand, segula. It's a a jewel that he holds in his hand. Because what does the Bible say? Nobody can snatch you because you're that jewel. So God's given us the Holy Spirit to walk in the Spirit and understand the teachings and instructions. He says, if you're going to be a royal priesthood, you have to have the Torah. See, Israel was the original witness in the beginning. Israel is the final witness in the last days. Israel is the final witness. The book of Leviticus is God's manual for his people on how to approach him and live pleasing in his sight. So remember the perspective that God's trying to give you, that this is my court, this is what I'm asking of you, this is what I'm setting up. And by the way, you know, if you stop and really think about it, the word priests in the Old Testament, it's Cohen. Right there, in parentheses it says, uh, Nathan and Ida. I don't know what version, but but listen to what it means now. Now listen, when, when you're called a priest, listen, this is... I'm telling you, the fear of God is on me right now. He is not to be messed with. I'm a priest. Really? What kind of priest are you? Do you know that there's pagan priests? There's priestesses. It means this. Literally, one officiating. Literally, one officiating. You're an officiator. You're officiating something. What? The kingdom of God. What he wants us to live and do. Chief ruler. You're a leader. You're a prince. You're also a principal officer. Now, he did establish the Levitical priesthood. And then we could get into Melchizedek and all that great stuff. But you are a priest. See, I'm a priest. I'm a priest, amen? You're a priest. Think about it. Really think about it. That is amazing. It might be said that Exodus records how Israel became a redeemed nation while Leviticus concerns the cleansing, worship, and service of that redeemed nation. Ooh, this is a game changer. This is why it's my favorite book. I'm I'm telling you, it really, really is. Because I'm going to break it down for you. How many of you love to read a good book? Oh, this is so good. How many hours were put into that? to create that wonderful book that you read within a week. Hours and hours. There's people writing about the Omer. Oh, it's just a few hours. He just threw it together. Hours and hours and hours. And you get the benefit. See, right now, you get the book of Leviticus. You get the benefit. I'm telling you, it'll change your life. Come out of her, my people, in Revelation it says. He doesn't want you in the system. He doesn't want you in the world. He wants you out of the world. Amen? 
Exodus begins with sinners, but Leviticus begins with saints. That is, as to their standing. W. Graham Scroggy. What a great theologian. Exodus begins with sinners, but Leviticus begins with saints. You know, Exodus is from groan to glory. That's Exodus. But right out of the gate, you're saints. So you shall be holy pervades the book. You shall be holy pervades the book. Amen? He's asking you to be holy. Say, I can be holy. I can be holy. Amen? Remember I told you to go to the deli. I went this last week. I got roast beef and Swiss cheese. I did. I just did it. I really did. It's holy cheese, folks. It helps. Now, this slide is really important because I love this one because now you're going to figure out your life. I'm telling you, some of you will never be the same after this. You're, this is a game changer. In the book of Leviticus, chapters 1 through 17 teach the way to God. Chapters 18 through 27 teach the walk with God. See, even when you stumble and you mess up, God enjoys watching you. He does. He goes, look at Nick. He fell down. You, oh, what a screw up. But look, he's getting up. He's coming back to me. He knows who he is. He knows who I am. He believes in himself. He's coming back to me. He doesn't gloat over your failures. Do you know when you ask for forgiveness, he never brings it back up. If you're hearing voices about past sins, that's the devil. That's not my father. My father never berates me or brings it up. As far as the east from the west, your sins are forgiven and gone. You need to understand that. That's a law. That's the law. The book of Leviticus starts off with five offerings. Leviticus chapter 1, 1 through chapter 7, verse 38. I'm going to break them down for you. Why are these sacrifices so important? Well, there's five, which is grace. They pertain to not only, you know, to the sacrificial system in and of itself, literally, but it also pertains to, to Yeshua, and it also pertains to us. Are you guys ready? Check out these five offerings that God has. The burnt offering is number one, Leviticus chapter 1, verses 3 through 17, uh, chapter 6, verses 8 through 13. This is a voluntary devoting all their very being and possessions to God through purifying fire. So volu voluntarily devoting all their very being and possessions to God through purifying fire. It's voluntary. So you're totally consumed. Does anybody see this? You give this offering, and it's totally consumed. It's a burnt offering, okay? And you, it's voluntary. He's not making it mandatory, okay? Do you guys understand that? It's a burnt offering. It's totally consumed. It's voluntary. Number two, you have the meal offering. Leviticus chapter 2, verses 1 through 16. Uh, chapter 6, verses 14 through 23. Also, it's called the meat offering. This is thanking God and offering their lives for his service. It's voluntary. Now, the meal offering usually goes with a burnt offering. So let's just look at the picture uh, for what it is. So you say to the Lord, Lord, I will serve you all my days. I dedicate my life to you. Okay, and that, you're a burnt offering. How many know what I'm talking about? When you put your hands up, that's to surrender. It's time to take the offering. That's what it is for the priesthood. When the hands go up, it means take the offering, Lord. They would get the offering ready, then their hands would be raised. And they're saying, Lord, receive it. Receive the offering, because that's what we are. We're, we're offerings. It, it's funny, too, because I know that I made a vow to the Lord when I got saved and born again that I can't get out of. He won't let you rest, because you made vows when you gave your life to him. And I'm going to tell you, there's a lot of vows we can break. He won't let you break that one. He won't let you get away from that because he, want, he wants you for himself. I mean, I have people ministering to me, and they were witnessing and doing things, and, and, and I finally realized that after the fact that they were trying to get me saved, born again. But I told them, no, I'm, right, I'm Catholic. See, I was Catholic. I was right. I'm good. Now, you guys might need to talk to me. But that's how I felt. I'm Catholic, even on my dog tags. It felt good. Catholic on my dog tags. I could relate. Didn't say atheist. Some people didn't have anything. Saw one guy's dog tags, religion, just nothing, N.A. or whatever. I'm like, man, I feel sorry for you. You're not even Catholic. Right? I'm nothing, man. And 
And it's interesting, too, because in the ministry of health, this is what this is. Now that you have given your life, we begin to serve. It's unleavened bread. But why do we get saved and then we want to call the shots? We want to be born again, and I call the shots. I do what I want to do, how I want to do it. Oh, and work with other people? Are you kidding me? No, they're going to work for me. You know the church is a place to give, not get. Did you know that? We come here to give something, not to take something. Go back and study the early church. So it's voluntary. Number three, the peace offering. Leviticus chapter 3, verses 1 through 17. Chapter 7, verses 11 through 34. Thank you, Father, for allowing me to share this. This means participating in the blessings of fellowship with God. This is voluntary. Now, we could break this down into so many cool things because you get to eat the peace offering. It's the one offering that you get to eat from. And why would you present a peace offering to the Lord? Well, let's say you, you, met a, you made a vow and you, and you succeeded in the vow and you bring peace offerings. You say, hey, I succeeded in this vow. You invite your friends and family. You all come around because, you know, God invented barbecue. And so you sit around, you get to eat of that. Hey, man, Nick did a peace offering. Man, he fulfilled that vow, man, you know. He gave up alcohol. He fulfilled that vow. He's been delivered. He wants you to come join the party. And it's just going to be, you know, Hawaiian punch for everybody. Come on. There's nothing else in there but Hawaiian punch. And let's say you meet a, a deadline or something really cool happens in your life. God just blesses you with something like crops or whatever. You, you go and say, I'm going to do a peace offering. You know, my, my crops are 100%. Like, you know, they talk about 30, 60, 100-fold return in, in the seed. And, and Isaac received that. Did you know that? He got a 100-fold return from his harvest. I don't pray 30 and 60. Never. I always pray 100%. So there are those three offerings. It's relevant for today, is it not? You give yourself to the Lord, you serve, God blesses you, and then you share it with others because you're in the kingdom. Well, gosh, Carolyn, why are you so happy? Well, because God's provided. He's done this for me. He's been there for me in this and that. And, and God's, you know, God's blessed me with my wife and my children, this church and everything I have. And I even get to borrow my father-in-law's suburban, and I don't ever want to give it back. It's terrible. It's like he's just trying to help me out. i got to give the suburban back. But, you know, it's these blessings that we can't take for granted. And guess what? It comes through people. Did you notice that? You know, did you notice that? So those first three are pretty cool, but now we got to get into the, the sin offering in Leviticus chapter 4, verses 1 through 5. Uh, and then, of course, uh, we'll say uh, verse 13, and then chapter 6, verses 24 through 30 is the reference. It's mandatory. Now you need a sin offering. Where is your offering? What is this about? Being forgiven because they were sinners. How many of you know we're, we're born with the sinful nature, the evil inclination. We, we just, we have it. You know, watch two kids fight over a toy. Mine, mine, mine. Where'd they learn that? It's in them. It's in all of us. Amen? Whatever's mine, I hide. So God's like saying, hey, you know what? This offering here, number four, this sin offering, you need it because you know what? You're a fallen creature. And, but if you want to come to me, this is the way you have to do it. So, you know, it's interesting today that the Jews don't, don't have a sacrifice, right? They don't have a sacrifice. They don't have a sacrificial system. How many know what I'm talking about? There's no more temple. So they had to come up with something. I'm just trying to share with you Judaism 101. So because they don't have a temple, and by the way, they don't eat lamb at Passover because there's no temple. Temple's a big deal, amen? From the temple, everything comes and orchestrates. And so basically what they've done is they've come together and they said, we're going to replace sacrifices with prayers and good deeds, or mitzvahs, a mitzvah, doing good deeds, okay? Because that's all they can do. How many know what I'm talking about? And I respect that. I'm not here to put it down. I'm only saying, and I, I would ask the question to you, where is your sacrifice? Because I need a sacrifice. Would you all agree? For the sinner that I am. So now it's even better because, okay, what happens? We have a trespass offering in Leviticus chapter 5, uh, verses 14 uh, all the way through chapter 6 and verse 7. And then we have, of course, chapter 7, verses 1 through 10. Being forgiven for the sins they committed. Trespasses. You ever seen a no trespassing sign when you were younger? That didn't mean nothing, did it? No, you're going to go back in there and get you some oranges or whatever you want to do. There's a little stream or a creek or a you know, place to play. And next thing you know, you're picking rock sod out of your backside. 
Yeah. So, so basically, uh, sin offering and trespass offering, you know, when you trespass against each other, you have to make it right. See what I'm saying? Go make it right with your brother. Remember? Then go bring your offering to me. So trespassing is very interesting. We can trespass against each other, and we can trespass against the Lord. Forgive us our what? Our trespasses. As we forgive those who what? Trespass against us. Okay? So is, is everybody there? Are you with me? So those first five offerings, it wasn't that difficult, was it? Do you understand now? So as you leave today, you're a burnt offering. You've given your life to the Lord. You know you have. But now you need to serve. You need to serve. You need to serve the body of Christ. Let me tell you something. If, if I'm just going to say that, you know, if we weren't that big, we'd still be in the living room, right? If God says, no, nope, this is it, we're just going to keep you in the living room, right? No. God is in the multiplicity. He's into addition, in addition to. I find that interesting about Yosef, you know. Yosef was in the Bible, was he not? He adds to the family. He had his coat of many colors, remember? Donny Osmond, remember? And so, so his name means in addition to, so he adds to the family. Did he not add to the family in the end? He saved his family from famine in addition to, to add to. Are you guys getting this? This isn't by chance, Yosef, that's... Nehemiah's middle name, Nehemiah Yosef. He's like, why'd you name me that? I added it in addition to, because there's a marker there. You know what I'm saying? Well, look what happens. The earthly father of Jesus, Yosef, in addition to, an earthly father in addition to. Wait, there's more. Say there's more? Joseph of Arimathea. <laughs> I'll give you my tomb. Nobody's even been in it. Not a small child, nobody. It's clean, it's nice, it's brand new. No one's even been in it. Yeshua went in there to add to. See, we're the house of Joseph. We should be adding to people's lives. We should be adding to the experiences, not taking away, not being negative, not tearing down. That's not the house of Joseph. We are in addition to the Jewish people. Judah means to praise. Judah, we're in addition to Judah. We're in addition to, we're coming alongside. Do you guys get this? This is so important that you understand this. Because he's going to, you know, you can go in and start breaking this down and just get the nuts and bolts of it. Just get it, the little outline of it. Say, wow, okay, this is God's throne. This is his kingdom, his court. I'm, I think I got this. Guess what happens now? The laws of consecration of priests. Leviticus chapters 8 through 10. He's going to consecrate the priests. Why? Because they're going to teach his kingdom. They're going, to teach, they're going to teach what's right and what is wrong. Amen? So Aaron and his sons are ordained, Leviticus chapter 8, verses 1 through 36. Now let's look at this ordination. This is so cool, this ordination. Because look at what they have to go through. I'm going to read it through the bullet points, and we're going to go through it. Read these bullet points. This is what had to happen in order for the priesthood to be consecrated. Boy, this is a big deal. This is what God is asking them to do. Here we go. A bullock and two rams were needed to ordain Aaron and his sons. Leviticus 8.2. All the congregation gathered at the door of the tabernacle of the congregation for the ordination. Leviticus 8.3. Moses washed Aaron and his sons with water. Leviticus 8.6. Moses took the anointing oil and anointed the tabernacle along with all that was in it. Leviticus 8.10. Not only was he preparing them, but he was preparing the place from which they would work. Amen. Moses sprinkled the anointing oil seven times upon the altar. Leviticus 8.11. Moses poured the anointing oil upon Aaron's head. Leviticus 8.12. Now the bullock was used for what? For the sin offering. Wow, Aaron had to have a sacrifice. Because they're fallen nature. The first ram was used for the burnt offering. Leviticus 8.18, was the first ram totally consumed? Yeah, because it's a burnt offering. The second ram was used for consecration. Leviticus 8.22, the second ram was used for consecration. So Moses applied the blood of the second ram for consecration on the following three body parts of Aaron and his sons on the tip of the right ear. Why? So they can hear from God. Number two, on the thumb of the right hand. What are you grabbing with your hands? What are you doing with your hands? 
Number three, on the great toe of the right foot. Where are you walking? Where are you going? Think about it. What are you listening to? What are you doing? And where are you going? Amen? It's like a teenager in my house. Hey, uh, where are you going? Right? Where are you going? Nowhere. Did you know that if you don't have your big toes, you can't balance yourself? The big toe actually causes you to balance and walk. So if you don't have your big toe, you're imbalanced. That's what can happen. The consecration lasted for seven days for Aaron and his sons. Leviticus chapter 8, verse 33. This is what it says. Let's read it. And you shall not go out of the door of the tabernacle of the congregation in seven days until the days of your consecration be at the end. For seven days shall he consecrate you. Seven means completion, right? Like when we do a cycle of the Torah, we're spiraling up. Did you know that? Everything is a spiral. It's cyclical. We're spiraling. There's a spiral that's taking us higher and higher to the Lord. That's what's happening. Seven days of unleavened bread, correct? Seven days for tabernacles. Seven days in the week. Seven is completion. This is why it's interesting that I believe that we're in the Hebrew uh, calendar of 5782. Is that correct? So 5,782 years ago, God created the heavens and the earth and Adam and Eve and all that stuff. But... It's interesting because we can't really get into dates, but if a day is to the Lord is a thousand years and a thousand years is as one day, I believe we're closer to the 6,000 mark than we know. We have a solar calendar, we have a lunar calendar, and we have all kinds of calendars, but I'm just saying I really sense and feel, and I say this assuredly just on my own evaluation, and I, I could be wrong, I believe we're the generation that will see the return of Christ. Now, I know a lot of people have said it and everything, But if you stop and look at the signs, like a Torah scroll in a church, that's a sign. If he's placing his word on our minds and our hearts, it's a sign. It's like a stop sign, okay? Tells you to stop. So we have this number seven. Aaron offers sacrifices in Leviticus chapter 9, verses 1 through 24. So now the sacrifices are going to start to go up. On the eighth day, Aaron and his sons offered up offerings for themselves and the people. Did you see that? For them and the people. Continue on. All the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. In Leviticus 9, 5, let's read it. And they brought that which Moses commanded before the tabernacle of the congregation, and all the congregation drew near and stood before the Lord. See, it's a community affair, isn't it? It's a community affair. Affair. Leviticus 9, 7, and offerings. And Moses said unto Aaron, Go unto the altar and offer thy sin offering and thy burnt offering and make an atonement for thyself and for the people and offer the offering of the people and make an atonement for them as the Lord commanded. I like that word atonement, at one meant. At one meant. So who created the sacrificial system? God did. God did right? God did. Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people to bless them, Leviticus 9.22. And Aaron lifted up his hand toward the people and blessed them and came down from offering of the sin offering and the burnt offering and peace offerings. It's really cool if you get in the Bible in the Old Testament and you see these word offerings, you kind of look it up and say, okay, David did an offering. Which one was it? Oh, this person did an offering in, in, the, in, in Judges. They were doing it. What offering were they doing? But now you break down the five offerings, it's quite exciting, is it not? Okay, two of you are still with me. I know, they're coming next week. Now, I want you to check this out because when you read the Bible and you do it, that's how this church was founded. Did you know that? Pastor T was reading the Bible. She says, why aren't we doing these things? Next thing you know, here comes Desiree, you know. Hey, I want to do it too. Jim, you doing Shabbat? I want to do it too. I want to do Shabbat, right? I want to do Shabbat. So they orchestrate all this stuff. They give them the instructions. There's the ordination for the priest. Offer these sacrifices up for yourself, the priesthood, and for the people. Look what happens. Glory. Leviticus 9, verses 23 and 24. 
And Moses and Aaron went to the tabernacle of the congregation and came out and blessed the people, and the glory of the Lord appeared unto all the people. And there came a fire out from before the Lord and consumed upon the altar the burnt offering and the fat, which when all the people saw, they shouted and fell on their faces. So what are you saying, Pastor Nick? When you do things right and you follow God's order, his glory comes down. His glory comes. I always pray for his presence. In this. I want his presence in this place more than anything. I just want his presence. Just want his presence. Just want his presence. The glory only comes when we're honest. If we're not an honest community, God's glory will never fall in here. Glory only comes when there's honesty. That's why we have to be honest with ourselves. We can't keep things inside. We have to express it. We have to get over it. We have to move on. I mean, I'm talking about. We don't carry that stuff. Why? Because we want his glory. You're naked. You have nothing to lose. You've confessed. You're here. And, 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 and you're saying, Lord, I've done what you've asked me to do. Now, give me your glory. Give me your presence. And I say this not in, in a disrespectful way or any kind of blasphemy or, Nick, you've lost your mind. How could you pray that? Because I found a pattern in the Bible. And I won't get into it all because this is a whole other series, a whole other teaching. Before a great move of God in his redemptive plan, God always shows up in a theophany. So what I do is I just pray and I talk because my wife, you know, she doesn't think I'm crazy anymore. She knows I'm talking to God. And I do. I talked to, talk to him this morning, just talking to him, just talking to him like I'm talking to you. Right? Laying in my bed. So I approach him and I say, you know, Lord, you appeared <laughs> in so many different ways. You had lunch with Abraham. And I know the Jewish people wouldn't want to hear this, but he ate a cheeseburger. He had meat and dairy. Did you know that? And the two ain't. Come on, people. He had lunch with Abraham. He did. Did you know that he appeared at Mount Sinai? Later on in Exodus 19, they had the wedding and the elders went up and they said they ate in his presence. Now, no one has seen the face of God and lived. We've seen Jesus in his earthly form. But what I'm trying to tell you is this. He, he was a theophany. Do I have you so far? Are you, are you with me? He had lunch with Abraham. He's at Mount Sinai having a wedding celebration meal with the elders, right? Am I right? What happens? What about even the burning bush? Was that a theophany? He said, I am, right? When he chose Moses, I am. There's three times there was a theophany. You see that? Jacob, very good. Thanks for reminding me. I don't have my list. Jacob wrestles with God. He said, I've seen God face to face. And God says, you know what? You've overcome men and me. That's what you've done. I wrestled you and you wrestled me back and you've overcome men and you've overcome me. You've wrestled me. So he changes his name to Israel, prevailing prince, co-ruler with God. He goes on to say, even in, in Joshua, Joshua had a theophany. Whose side are you on? Remember, the angel said, you better take your shoes off. <laughs> That's who I am. <laughs> there go the, right? So I've been going to the Lord. And I said, Lord, you know, since 722 B.C., we've been in exile, we've been in captivity, but we're coming home, we're coming back. I said, I, I want you to show yourself in our church. I want you to appear before the whole congregation. I said, Lord, I don't care if you're a little child or a service dog. I don't care. I told the Lord, Lord, whatever you want to do. You know, people were always wondering, how did Jesus elude people in a crowd? You know they wanted to grab him and kill him and throw him off cliffs. Did you know that? One, one author was saying he was a shapeshifter. He could change his appearance while he was in the crowd. I mean, think about it. You wonder sometimes. I don't believe that. Well, he can walk on water. He can multiply food. He's one of the greatest dermatologists in the leper colony. Everybody goes to him. I don't believe he can shape shift his image. He can do whatever he wants. He goes through doors, right? He didn't have a key. Forgot my keys. Oh, hey, I'm Jesus. I am the key. I'm the key of David. 
None of this is even on here, folks. Why do you put up with me? Why? Not even on here. I just think about these things all the time. Because we need Bible revival, man. You need Bible revival. Some of you got to get off that internet and get into the Bible net. <laughs> oh, yeah, there's some good stuff in here. One book you pick up, you never put down. You notice that? Never finished it. But look what happens now. God sets everything up, and then there's going to be an example. The sin of Nadab and Abihu. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 through 20, we have the sin of Nadab and Abihu. Now the glory's already come down. Everything's great. Grand opening, blah, blah, blah. Now all of a sudden, Nadab and Abihu want to buck the system. How many of we could all be an example? I don't look at them like, why'd they do that? So let's break down a few things why they were guilty. Number one, strange fire. Leviticus chapter 10, verses 1 and 2. They have strange fire. And Nadab and Abihu, the sons of Aaron, took either of them his censer and put fire therein and put incense thereon and offered strange fire before the Lord, which he commanded them not. And there went out fire from the Lord and devoured them, and they died before the Lord. He literally sucked their breath out and they collapsed. Now, when you see strange fire, it's real simple. They didn't get the fire from the altar. Okay? From the fire of the altar comes all the fire, okay, to light the menorah, to light the incense, okay? Does everybody understand that? And, and the, the altar was to burn continually. We all got saved at different points of time. Mine was in the evening. Some people got in the morning, some people in the afternoon. I got born again at you know, this time or that time because the altar is always up and running, the altar. So strange fire was not good. Leviticus chapter 10, verse 9, now we have alcohol involved. Do not drink wine nor strong drink, thou nor thy sons with thee. When you go into the tabernacle of the congregation, lest ye die, it shall be a statute forever throughout your generations. So if you're in the ministry or if you're a pastor or whatever, clergy, it's not good to have, you know, happy hour, then go do a service. Do you see where you got to have some management of your senses and faculties, see? Because drugs and alcohol alter our will. So they made a mistake by having strong drink, and that probably led to the strange fire. Does everybody see this? Okay. And so, you know, um, Aaron went to Moses because Moses was mad at Aaron because when Nadab and Behu did their sacrifices, you know, they weren't supposed to become a burnt offering. They weren't supposed to be a burnt offering. And, and Aaron says, what was I to do? My sons fell dead. I just let, I let it become a burnt offering. And Moses says, that's good. I'll accept that. But it wasn't supposed to be a burnt offering. You go back and study all this and how, it, how, it's, how it plays out. How many of you know I'm talking about? So that's Nadab and Abihu uh, right there in Leviticus chapter 10. Once again, we're still in the way to God. Then we're going to get into laws of purity. Uh, Leviticus chapter 11, 12, 13, 14, and 15. So chapters 11 and 15 are laws of purity. You go back and study it for yourself. Look at it, okay? Different things uh, that you can um, figure out which is very interesting. And now we're going to get into the fun part of this, dietary laws. Oh, yeah, clean versus unclean, because this is all part of purity, right? There's clean and there's unclean. So Leviticus chapter 11, verses 1 through 47, are the dietary laws, chapter 11. And that is, of course, the what? It's the way to God. God tells us what to eat. I believe that. Do you believe that? I'm not putting on anybody. Well, I believe it. God told me what to eat, what not to eat. He's my Abba. People think Jesus just came along and said, oh, you can eat whatever you want now. My father, you know, he doesn't like that stuff. But you can, you can eat whatever you want in my name. The son would never go against the father. Why can't we grow up? Look at Levit Levit Lev well, it's Leviticus 11.3. Whatsoever part of the hoof and is cloven-footed and cheweth the cud among the beasts, that shall you eat. So those are the requirements, isn't it? For anything on the land. Or the fowls of the air? I mean, I mean, you know what I'm talking about when you look at that. Fins and scales in Leviticus 11, 9. Let's read it. These shall you eat of all that are in the waters. Whatsoever hath fins and scales in the waters, in the seas and in the rivers, them shall you eat. It's got to have fins and scales. Amen? You know what I find interesting? Remember when they put the net in the water, the one parable, and they get all the fish? and they get rid of the bad fish, 
those are the ones that don't have fins and scales. The clean ones they put in vessels. That's a parable coming up in, in the Gospel of Matthew. So here is a list of unclean foods that should not be eaten. Okay, listen to me. Don't eat your cat. Please. Okay? Don't eat your cat. Don't eat the hippo. Now, I, know, I know I could feed a big family. Don't eat hippo. Don't eat rabbit. You know? It's not just Easter that the bunny's bad. The rabbit's bad. It's like the rabbit's foot. Oh, I got this for good luck. Well, it wasn't for the rabbit. He's like, how's it working out for you, Nick? Good luck. I know, the crazy things we do in the culture, if you really stop and think about it, like cutting down a perfectly good tree, putting it in your house, and it just dies. I'm moving on. I'm not at the feast, feast days. You can't eat swine. There's no swine where I dine. That's what Pastor Randy used to say at the restaurants. There's no swine where I dine. I laugh. <laughs> the waitress is like, ah. There's no pork on the end of my fork. That's right. Oh, you guys are going to be repeating these things. Don't worry. Can't have clams, crab, or jellyfish. Can't have lobster, octopus, oyster, scallops, shrimp, buzzards. You can't eat buzzard, folks. The buzzard eats you. Don't you see them on the road? Do you know that they, they don't even have a department of roadkill anymore in our government, in our county? Did you know that? They let nature take care of it. Seriously. Yeah. You can't eat flamingos. You know why? Because they eat shrimp. That's why they're pink. Did you get that? Some of you are thinking about the Florida lottery right now. i got to do my numbers, that flamingo. You know the flamingo? Don't eat it. Don't eat the raven. Don't eat the alligator. Don't eat the frog or the snail or the snake or the turtle. Don't do it. Turtle soup. No, don't do it. And it's so funny how people get all jacked up. You can't tell me what to eat. Go eat whatever you want. But God says, but look at what you get to eat. The list of clean foods that can be eaten. You can eat buffalo. Buffalo burgers. Good. You can have deer. You can have goat. Sheep. You can have albacore, anchovies. You can have bass. Carp, cod, flounder, grouper, salmon, snapper, trout, tuna, chicken, dove, quail, and turkey. Look at all those things you get to eat. Now, what's the principle? What's clean and what's unclean? You know, and if you eat it, you're only unclean until the evening, then it starts over. It's just trying to show you the difference. A lot of these things are, you know, they're just like the, you know, garbage feeders at the bottom of the ocean. One guy was telling me he was in Vietnam and going along the river, you know, and he saw a body there with just crabs just chowing down on one of the bodies for more. Cockroaches of the bay. Yeah, where's the beef? Leviticus chapter 11, verses 46 and 47, unclean and clean. This is the law of the beasts and of the fowl and of every living creature that moveth in the waters and of every creature that creepeth upon the earth to make a difference between the unclean and the clean and between the beast that may be eaten and the beast that may not be eaten. Amen? It's a choice. We get into laws of motherhood now. Leviticus chapter 12, verses 1 through 8. Boy, this one's tough. You have a male child. The purification process is for 40 days. If you have a daughter, a female, the process is for 80 days. Now, I don't get the full story of this and, and give you some explanation because I'm still kind of studying it. But if you have a son, it's 40 days. If you have a daughter, it's 80 days. You understand what I'm saying? So it's about intimacy, being with your wife and all that. So it's kind of interesting because, you know, I got Josiah, Nehemiah, and Micah. Not 40 days. God's like, and now I'm going to test you. Oh, yeah. I'm going to test you, little Nikki. Oh, you, it's 80 days. Oh, you got five daughters? <laughs> Is this ever going to end? 
It's double. Five daughters. I'm going to move on. This is a family church. And that's how we produce family. Uh, Levit- Leviticus 13, test of leprosy. Now we're getting into dermatologists. You know, when he had a problem, you went to the priest. You didn't go to the medicine cabinet or whatever or, or the liquor cabinet. You went to the priest. But look at what's happened to our society. They make the priesthood look bad, make the pastors look bad, make the church look bad. They're greedy. They're this. They're hypocrites. Don't go to them. I'm here to serve you. Did you know that? Test of leprosy, Leviticus, Leviticus 13. Cleansing of leprosy, Leviticus 14. And unclean issues, Leviticus 15. Look at the principle. Look at the principle. Clean versus unclean. Amen? It's like, you know, as men, you know, just to say, you know, um, if you spill your seed, you're unclean. Now, you can fight and argue all, all you want with me or whatever. God's trying to teach principles. He's teaching principles. Amen? The one son wouldn't use his seed to carry on his brother's family, right? God took him. <laughs> See, everything's for a reason. It's a principle. Leviticus 13, 2, let's read it. When a man shall have in the skin of his flesh a rising, a scab, or bright spot, and it be in the skin of his flesh like the plague of leprosy, then he shall be brought unto Aaron the priest or unto one of his sons the priests. If you look at some of the cases of leprosy, a lot of it is rebellion. Look at, look at Miriam. She came against Moses, and she broke out with leprosy. It's an outward manifestation of what's going on on the inside. King Uzziah. He stormed his way through 80 priests to light incense as a king of Judah. He's Judah. He's the king of Israel. He's from Judah. And he he stormed his way through 80 priests trying to stop him. And he got there and did the incense. And it said the leprosy broke out starting with his forehead, brazen forehead. He died a leper. See, as we move forward in the days ahead, God has a role for us to play. We have to play that role of the nations, of the Gentiles coming out of the nations as the house of Joseph, as Ephraim. That is our role. We don't have to try to play another role or do something else. This is the role that we play for God. Does everybody understand that? That's what we do. You need to understand that. So you have this plague of leprosy. Now, the word plague, number 5061 in the Strong's Concordance, is the Hebrew word nega, and it means the following, a blow, figuratively, infliction, by implication, or implying a spot, a sore, stricken, stripe, or wound. That's what this word means in regards to leprosy. Now, I find it interesting because Solomon's prayer of dedication of the temple, 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 through 53. I want to read one verse from this reference. So 1 Kings chapter 8, verses 22 through 53 is Solomon's prayer when he dedicated the temple at Tabernacles. How many know what I'm talking about? Now, this is an incredible prayer that's universal, that's relevant for today. But look at 1 Kings 8, 38. This was containing his prayer. What prayer and supplication soever be made by any man or by all thy people Israel, which shall know every man the plague, nega, of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house. Now, there's a big debate about the temple, but that's where his name is. The temple mount is where God's name is. So he's saying, when you pray, lift up your hands and face towards where my name is. How many of you were there when I went to Christian retreat and everybody got up, put their hands up, and prayed to the east? How many remember that, right? I was sharing this with my pastor friends. I said, you know, God showed me that if we raise our hands and we face east and we ask for forgiveness, he'll hear our cries and he'll forgive us. <laughs> I'll never forget Pastor Don. He's like, well, let's do it. I'm like, all right. We, we all got up. We faced east and we asked for forgiveness for our sins and we prayed. Nobody argued. That's, that's religious. That's a law. What is that? That's goofy. No, this prayer is for the following people. This prayer is for the following people. It says right here, any man, 1 Kings 8.38, thy people, Israel, 1 Kings 8.30. Oh, and the stranger, 1 Kings 8.41. Does everybody see that? 
Does everybody see that? So what happened to me, after Passover, April 8th of 2020, in the evening on Wednesday was Passover, we were going into Unleavened Bread, and it was on a Sunday, April 12th, 2020, during Unleavened Bread, that God showed me this verse. He says, you don't have COVID, but you have something else in your heart. I wept. I was on the back of my house, the patio area, just crying out to the Lord, had a modern English version of the Bible, and I was reading it. And and God took me right to this verse and got me through the whole COVID thing now. Now I get it. I got to deal with the plague in my own heart. Does everybody see that? Life-changing. Life-changing. Three areas of contamination. Skin, clothing, and houses. Skin, clothing, and houses. Three areas of contamination. The guy that does our carpets, he says, you have some of the best carpets that I've ever done. He says, all these churches are eating and drinking and just, I got to go there like every three, six months and clean it. He says, this carpet is probably the best I've seen because it's a church. It's a sanctuary. It's not a bingo hall. It's not for rollerblading. It's It's a house of prayer. It's a house of study. It's a house of worship. Amen? And that's why it stays nice. And we're going to talk about that because places can be designated holy. Did you know that? We're going to talk about that. In Leviticus 16 and 17, what are we? We're still what? Way to God. The Day of Atonement is the way to God, Leviticus 16 and 17. Does everybody see that? So as far as atonement goes, look at Leviticus 16, verses 29 and 30. And this shall be a statute forever unto you, that in the seventh month, on the tenth day of the month, you shall afflict your souls and do no work at all, whether it be one of your own country or a stranger that sojourneth among you. For on that day shall the priest make an atonement for you to cleanse you, that you may be clean from all your sins before the Lord. I don't want to get into it all, but if you didn't have the golden calf incident, you wouldn't need the day of atonement. It's interesting, isn't it? If you count, and we'll get into the, the, the feast days here. It's funny how, you know, when you look at this, the Day of Atonement, if you took it out, think about how the progression would be for the feasts. Think about it. You'd have a trumpet blast, and then you'd celebrate tabernacles. Because there's eight feast days counting the Sabbath. Eight is what? New beginnings. So God probably had seven, and then we messed up, and he added one. Everybody see that? Because he's like, you need a new beginning. Because you ain't complete. So there's two goats in Leviticus chapter 16. uh, And of course, they drew lots. And one lot was the atonement of the holy place because of the uncleanness and transgressions of Israel. That's the one goat is offered up. The other goat is the scapegoat or Azazel sent out into the wilderness after hands laid on it to transfer their sins. So there had to be a uh, atonement for the place and for their sins and to send their sins away into the wilderness. By the way, that goat was let off a cliff. It's believed, archaeologically speaking, that in Israel they found a place of goat bones at the bottom of this cliff. Could be. I mean, very interesting study, public records to say the least. I find it interesting that in the book of Enoch, Azazel is the chief demon. I don't believe in the book of Enoch. Well, I don't care. Just telling you. You could read other sources, right? What, what are you scared of? Build your case. Remember, I'm an attorney. Leviticus 17, 11. For the life of the flesh is in the blood, and I have given it to you upon the altar to make an atonement for your souls, for it is the blood that maketh an atonement for the soul. Amen? The cross-reference can be found in Hebrews 9, 22. For the life of the flesh is in the blood. The life of the flesh is in the blood. So when they took that lamb and they slaughtered and put the blood on the doorpost, there was the flesh of the lamb and the blood. Yeshua's body is the flesh and his blood gives us atonement. The worst thing that could ever happen to you, going to hell, being separated from God, cannot happen. You are going to be with him forever. You've accepted Jesus Christ as your personal Lord and Savior. You've got to give him some praise. You did it. The rest is extra credit. Our lives now is extra credit. If you recognize the Son, the Father recognizes you. 
That was the, that's the biggest hurdle that people have. It's the biggest hurdle that I ever had was to be born again and recognize him for who he is and for my sins and that he's the redeemer. That was the biggest hurdle I ever had to get over. But now I'm over it. This stuff is easy now. It was hard getting there. In the book of Leviticus, chapters 1 through 17 is the way to God. And chapters 18 to 27 is the walk with God. Come on, somebody. Who wants to walk with God? We did. We're, we're doing it. Now, check it out. We're going to shift gears. I thought this part was really good. Leviticus chapters 18 through 20 is all about a holy people. It's all about a holy people. Leviticus chapters 18, 19, 20. I'm telling you, all of you are going to graduate today, and you're not going to summer school. Because we're already in verse, you know, chapters 18 to 20. A holy people. Go back and look at it. In Leviticus 18, we have sins done in secret. These are laws on immoral relations. Sins done in secret. Well, what are you saying, Pastor Nick? Now, check out this revelation. If we're making our way to God, right, it's chapters 1 to 17. Would you agree that we've done that journey? We're there. Now we want to walk with God. We want to hold his hand. Guess what? You have secret sins. He wants to walk with you. He knows your secret sins. Sometimes social media knows your secret sins. Your family knows your secret sins. People have walked in on you. They know your sins. Well, what are you saying, Pastor Nick? We have to acknowledge the secret sins if we want to walk with God. Amen. Tim's sitting right here. He's sober. He's sober. And I believe in him. Bill Carter, sober. Sober. They're sober. He's not hiding anything. He didn't fall off the wagon. You can, but he should be proud of himself that he's come this far. Say, I, could, I did today, I can do tomorrow. I've been there, I know. I could have, I could have went backslid and been, like, drinking and stuff, but by God's grace, I didn't. He empowered me not to. He empowered, I, I see alcohol, I see poison. I see like a dead rat. I see poison, decon. I just, it just reminds me, it's just poison. I mean, think about it, guys. You go to the bar or you go to the liquor store, it says spirits. <laughs> Come on in. <laughs> and if the Bible even talks about getting drunk and passing out, and then you wake up and you do it again. I'm like, oh my gosh, that's living? That's dying. And I don't want to get into all the subject matter in 18, but it's secret sins, improper relationships. So Leviticus 18.30, defile. Therefore shall you keep mine ordinance that you commit not any one of these abominable customs which were committed before you, and that you defile not yourselves therein. I am the Lord your God. Remember, he gets upset over idolatry. He doesn't like idolatry. Paul gets into all this in the New Testament because we don't want to sacrifice to demons. We don't want to worship demons. And that's what happens when you have idols. That's why David got away with the stuff he got away with, because he wasn't an idolater. He had a moral failure like we all do, but he wasn't an idolater. Are you guys getting this? Holy priest, chapter 21. There's regulations concerning priests, chapter 21. Chapter 22, flawless animals for sacrifice, amen? We want to give our best to God. Amen. That's how I feel. We want to give our best to him. Remember it talks about, I think it's the Malachi, you wouldn't give, you know, a blemished sacrifice to the governor. Why would you give it to God? Right? Leviticus 23, verses 1 through 44. Oh, this is one of my favorite things. Holy convocations. We got the Sabbath, Passover, unleavened bread, first fruits, Pentecost, Yom Teruah or Rosh Hashanah, Yom Kippur, the Day of Atonement, Tabernacles, God's calendar. We're walking with God today. We're celebrating Shabbat. We're walking with God. Amen. Last night we got Shabbat. We're walking with God. We're celebrating Shabbat. We're walking with God. Well, I just thought you were a Seventh Day Adventist. I'm walking with God. I'm a Seventh-day Adventist. Yeah, you can add that. We can't take this stuff for granted. If you don't enjoy this like me, then you don't need to be practicing your faith here. No, I'm telling you, I come to the services. I sit here. I enter in. I, I don't know what my kids are doing. 
My wife said, they're talking, they're talking. I said, I am too. I'm talking to God. <laughs> they're all talking. Tell the girls to be quiet. I said, the girls, they're not going to be quiet. My little Eva, I mean, what do you, come on, people. Be real. My little Eva, I tell you, I'm learning, little Eva. She comes up to me. And I'm trying to walk away a little bit. I thought I got it all. No, she, no, no, she's following me. She ain't done. I'm trying to put it all together. Okay, let me write this. Let me, uh, let me write this down, Eva. But it's funny. So prophetically, we're in Shavuot, but man, we've got all these ugly spirits out there. We got to get rid of the ugly spirits. We want the Holy Spirit. We want to be convicted. I want to be convicted. I want my conscience to be clean, not seared like a hot iron. I want a clean conscience that I've done what God has asked me to do. I've made my amends. If I'm offended, I will go to you. I will settle my score. I'll settle my business, but I'm not going to hang on to stuff. I can't. I'm married, got eight kids. (laughs) My wife and I have new offenses every day. I can't even think about the past. I can't even think about what she did two weeks ago, to be honest with you, because she's going to do something today or tomorrow, just like me. We're made for each other because we don't have any grudges. We don't. We just get over it. It's, it's, it's the best thing in the world, you know. Can you imagine somebody being mad at you for like two weeks? I'm still mad at you. Come on, man. It's been six months. Come back to the bedroom. Help me out here. What are you doing? But there are people that could probably hold on to some grudges. It says when you bury the ax, you know, don't leave the handle up. Oh, yeah, I'll tell you, I bet I get this thing back. (laughs) Yeah, I think they got ax throwing on Oakfield. That's not good, folks. (laughs) We're moving on past the feast days. There's restitution, Leviticus chapter 24, verses 17 through 21. If you're going to walk with God, you have to have restitution. Remember an eye for an eye? The cross-reference is Matthew chapter 5, verses 38 through 42. Now, I want you to get the understanding of what Yeshua is trying to say and do. Audrey understands restitution. If she wrongs somebody, she wants to make it right. So what Jesus is saying in this particular reference of Scripture, turn the other cheek, go the extra mile, give them the extra clothing because they don't understand restitution. Are you getting it? You can't make people ask for forgiveness. You can't go to say, you need to ask for forgiveness. You, can, you need to learn restitution. You owe me. You know you can't do that? So when you go back and keep it in, 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 in context, it makes perfect sense. So if you have to turn the other cheek, it's because they don't understand restitution. Makes sense, doesn't it? It's not about, hey, I'm going to pluck out your eye too. It's all about restitution. Eye for an eye, tooth for a tooth. If it fits, you know, the restitution has to fit the crime. You can, you can get into all that more than, than you want. We have the Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee, Leviticus 25, verses 1 through 55. Uh, Sabbath year and the year of Jubilee. The Jubilee in Leviticus 25, 10, we're walking with God. And you shall hallow the 50th year and proclaim liberty throughout all the land unto all the inhabitants thereof. It shall be a jubilee unto you. And you shall return every man into his possession. And you shall return every man into his family. Does everybody see that? We're, we're, getting, we're getting there. Don't worry. So if you want to walk with God, think about this, though. They never let the land rest. God kicked them out of the land and made that his suffer. Remember the 70 years? For not keeping this. It's a big deal. I've got some people trying to figure out the Jubilee, and I want you to think about this. Do you remember when Yeshua opened up the scroll? He says, this has been fulfilled, and he actually declared a Jubilee. I mean, now, I haven't personally done this, but if he said that, that means that that was a Jubilee. Then you got to figure out 50, 50, right? See how close we are. I don't know. I I don't know. I don't know what it is. Now I got you thinking. Leviticus 25, 23, the land belongs to the United Nations. No. The land shall not be sold forever, for the land is mine, for you are strangers and sojourners with me. The land belongs to Yahweh. Amen? You guys are doing good. 
they asked me to do the National Day of Prayer in Tampa. Well, not this year, but it was a few years back, some years back. Yeah, it wasn't this time. And I asked the Lord, Lord, what should I pray? He said, I want you to pray this over the people. I prayed that prayer. And it looks on people's faces. And Lord, I lift up the land of Israel. And I would like to read Leviticus 25, 23. And I read, I said, for the land belongs to God. And it was like this. What kind of prayer was that? <laughs> I thought you prayed for the county or the mayor. <laughs> but that's what I prayed. I walked away. <laughs> I never prayed there again. Establish his covenant, Leviticus 26, 9. For I will have respect unto you and make you fruitful and multiply you and establish my covenant with you. When you're walking with God, he has good things, amen? Walk among the children of Israel, Leviticus 26, 12. And I will walk among you and will be your God and you shall be my people. You know, it's kind of interesting, you know, when you think about how good God is to me or to us, you know, it, it, it's funny. Sometimes, you know, my, my teenagers would be like, hey, pops, you know, can you, because uh, I, I actually uh, have a card to their account, and um, it's not because they're going to give me any money, but I'm on their account, and I can transfer funds, and they love it. So it's like one of them can say, hey, you know, can you just transfer maybe 25 bucks for me, you know, and they say, thank you, and I feel good. I'm like, man, I get to do this because I'm blessed, you know? There's probably nothing worse than having insufficient funds in front of the waitress. I'm sorry, your car didn't go through. <laughs> and I'm, yeah, I'm a sick father on it. Um, yeah, how dare you? So anyway, he wants to bless us. You know, and it's like when we want to do something for somebody, we, we got to have good motives. But when people say, well, well why did you do that? Because I, I wanted to. You know? And I will walk among you and be your God, and you shall be my people. Amen? This is holy ground, this, this property. He walks among this property. He's going to get into some consequences in Leviticus chapter 26, verses 1 through 46. Just recompenses right there. You can go back and study this. And listen, when I read stuff and I don't understand, I just say, Lord, give me understanding. What can I get out of this? Look at some commentary. Try to figure some things out. But Leviticus chapter 26, verses 1 through 13, uh, you also have blessings of obedience. And then you have in Leviticus 26, verses 14 through 46, penalties of disobedience. Amen. How many that God chastises who he loves? And, and it actually means pain in the Greek. It's in the Greek. Uh, the word chastisement, if you look it up in the Greek, it means pain. It hurts, Right? Leviticus chapter 26, verses 44 and 45, the covenant. And yet for all that, when they be in the land of their enemies, I will not cast them away, neither will I abhor them to destroy them utterly and to break my covenant with them, for I am the Lord their God. But I will for their sakes remember the covenant of their ancestors, whom I brought forth out of the land of Egypt in the sight of the heathen, that I might be their God. I am the Lord. Amen. Notice that's Leviticus 26, verses 44 and 45. Finishing up my last six slides here. You want to walk with God? You got to understand vows. Leviticus chapter 27, verses 1 through 34. Laws of dedicated persons and things. Animals dedicated to God. Houses dedicated to God. Fields dedicated to God. Amen. You know how many verses are on the floor in the walls of this church? A lot. All on the floor, verses, the walls. We wrote all these biblical verses all over, all over. The Word of God is permeated all through here, everything. The altar, everything. Three things are God's forever. Three things are God's forever. Number one, the firstborn of animals. It's a principle. Number two, all dedicated things. Number three, all ties of the people. They're God's forever. Some people would give to a church and they say, oh, look, that pastor, he, brought, he bought a plane and he's got his house in the Caribbean. When you give a tithe, that's to God. It has nothing to do with the church or the person. 
A tithe is a tithe. And every one of us are given an account, right? Every one of us are going to give an account. I think a lot of things in the last days are being exposed. A lot of things are going to be exposed. Some in the next life, some in this life. So I want you to think about this because this is so important because we live in such a dirty world. What is even sanctified anymore? But four things can be sanctified. Four things. Time. Sabbaths and feast days. Time can be sanctified. Now somebody do the math for me. You got a little, I know you got your phone. Our service is three hours. We'll just say three hours, Saturday, and then, of course, Monday is two hours for our Bible study. I want to take five hours out of the week. What's 24 times seven? Is there any homeschoolers can help me out right now? 168? Okay, divide five into 168 and give me a percentage. What is the percentage that we are together in time? No. 3%. 3.3% of our time is spent together. Now, I want you to think about that. I'm adding Monday. Only five hours divided into the week. So every week, we come together 3.3% of the time. And some of you are having a hard time with that. No, think about that. I know. Now, the Holy Spirit showed me that some years ago. I thought, that's disturbing. We want to get out of here? When is it over? 3.3%. You could add prayer, because I know people come to prayer. It's not very, new moon. 3.3%. And we have eternal life. We're driving, we're going to work, we're sleeping, we're watching TV. Amen. I mean, think about it. You watch Titanic, there's your 3%. Right? That movie's playing. You ain't even getting up going to the bathroom. Everybody's getting up here, boy. It's like a wave of people up and down, up and down. Right? Braveheart, three hours. Freedom! (laughs) You just spent 3% of your time with Mel Gibson. What about space? Space could be sanctified. A field, tabernacle, a temple, a sanctuary of Beit Tehillah. Amen? You know, a lot of churches, they, you could rent out your church, but do we really want to rent out our church? Do we even know what kind of spirits we're going to get in here? But we need the money. No, we don't. <laughs> no, I need the Holy Spirit in here. <laughs> I'm trying to get spirits out of me and you. You think I want to add something else? Ding, ding, ding. <laughs> objects can be sanctified. Clothing, tabernacle, furniture. Objects can be sanctified. Amen? You put the mezuzahs on your door, right? You're sanctifying your home. I'll tell you a funny story. My dad came to our, uh, my duplex. No, I think he came to my house. And I had a temporary mezuzah there. It was a temporary mezuzah. And my dad comes to the front door, and he takes and he grabs it and pulls it off because it was temporary, it had like this foam back. He goes, what is this? Dad, don't do that. My mezuzah, your moo moo what, what, moo Yeah, we put this on our doorpost. Oh, I need to talk to you. <laughs> People can be sanctified. The high priest, Levites, Moses, Jeremiah, John the Baptist, the children of Israel, all of you are sanctified. What does that mean, set apart? In the book of Leviticus, chapter 1 through 17, teach redemption and the day of atonement. Chapters 18 through 27 teach restoration and jubilee. So Leviticus begins with consecration and ends in consecration. The last slide, and all of you are going to graduate. Leviticus 11.45 Let's all stand for this last verse. And then I'm going to close it in prayer. Let's read it together. For I am the Lord that bringeth you up out of the land of Egypt to be your God. You shall be, therefore be holy, for I am holy. Father, I pray 
over your sons and daughters in this house. This is a sanctified, set-apart house with a sanctified, set-apart sons and daughters of you, Father. I pray for everyone, Father, to realize that you're asking us to be holy and you wouldn't ask for something unless we could perform it and do it. By your spirit, with our convictions, Father, we desire to be sanctified and set apart because we are justified by the finished work of the cross. So, Father, I give you permission to rule and reign in this place, Father, on the property, in the parking spaces, in all the buildings, every blade of grass. Walk among us in this property, Father. People that walk by, let them get saved, healed, and delivered. People driving by, let them get saved, healed, and delivered, Father. We ask this in the name of Yeshua, HaMashiach of Nazareth. Amen.